Hallelujah, God. We thank you so much, God. My defender, Jesus. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good, Jesus. You truly are our You're a true and living God, Jesus. You bless us in the field and you bless us in the city. Hey, Jesus. You're such a mighty and awesome God. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing, all that you have done, all that you have already brought us through, all the things that you're preparing for us, God. We thank you for a future with favor, God. We thank you for your blessings on our life. Now, God, we just want to pray for Reverend Darlene's family and Sister Everleen Cox. We want to pray for Deacon Joyner's dad, that you keep your hand on him, God, and Deacon Mathis and Sarah McFadden and the many sick and shut in, God. Put your hand on them, God. Touch them right now in the name of Jesus. Touch this church. Touch our leaders. Touch, Father, this congregation. Touch our community. Touch all the brothers and sisters that have been furloughed, God. Restore unto them that which was taken, God. The canker worm and the locust can't take it from them, God. Bless them right now, God. And now stand in my body, think with my mind. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my shepherd, my redeemer. Come on, put your hands together and bless the shepherd. Yeah, he's the shepherd in the house. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, God. Just grab your Bibles and go to the 23rd division of Psalm. And many of you can quote it off the top of your head because mama made you do it. Sunday school made you do it. You had to know this Psalm just to be a, a, a believer, really just to be a human being. Even agnostics know this. Amen. Non-believers, pagans know this. But I'm reading it out of the King James because King James captures the beauty of the poetry unlike any other translation. Amen. Psalm 23. We're in our worship versus worry series. And going into... Black History Month, we're going to look at the psalms that were used for our struggle as a people, like 137 and, and some very famous psalms that were used throughout our struggle and continues to be used, and we're going to focus on some of those, amen, but worry versus worship. Psalm 23, if you got the King James, y'all can, if you know it by heart, let's say it all together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. On this annual conference Sunday, I just want to tag this very familiar song, hymn, and prayer and call it Table, Table Manners and Matters. Table manners and matters just ask your neighbor I hope you ask your neighbor and say you, I know you got some manners <laughs> amen keep your I know you got some manners table matter manners and matters tables pray with me and stay with me there are certain songs and prayers and fragments of scripture so familiar and so well loved that the preacher's task has less to do with sleuthing out meaning hidden from view and more to do with witnessing to the forms of life these texts have shaped. If such a list of fragments was to be curated Psalm 23 would appear somewhere near the top. 
I dare say preaching such a popular text is quite dangerous. For sentimentalism can easily supplant exegesis. And when that happens, our well-worn readings tend to mute the fresh word from God to the contemporary community. Psalm 23 is a song and a prayer of trust. Somebody say trust. A song of trust as, as it is Psalm number 4, 11, 27, 16, 62, and 131. Songs of trust and prayers of trust have two things in common. A perceived calamity of some kind and trust that the calamity or disaster shall pass and all will be well. Psalm 23 is quiet on the crisis that led to its composition. Rather, it functions to remind its audience of the relationship between God and God's people. And, and perhaps most importantly, the psalm remind readers about the beauties of living life in the here and now. Even amidst the unusual darkness that accompanies day-to-day -day life. Do I have a witness? There's a lot of darkness out here. Amen. And so Psalm 23 sets the table of life in all environments, green pastures, near seaside or water, near death, in the midst of darkness, in the paths of righteousness, and so on and so on. Not only is Psalm 23 a song of trust, but it's also a messianic song in nature, along with Psalm 22 and 24. 23 forms a tri tri trilogy of, on Christ the shepherd. All three of them, 22, 23, and 24, forms a trilogy on Christ the shepherd. Um, Psalm 22, which Jesus quoted several times in the gospel, uh, is a picture of the ch ch good shepherd that dies for his sheep. And Psalm 23 is the great shepherd that lives and cares for his sheep and equips them for ministry. While 24 is the chief shepherd who returns from glory to reward his sheep for their service. Oh, I'm getting happy in my spirit just thinking about it. Psalm 23 is often used at home goings and funerals, but his emphasis is not about death. Uh, it's really about the father and what all God does every day of our life uh, for his sheep to make sure his sheep has abundant life. Uh, yes, we use them at funerals, but that's not his intention. Uh, his intention is to really talk about life, that we should have life and have it more abundantly. And so the shepherd wants the sheep to live full on purpose and die empty. Can I say that one more time? Because that ought to be everybody's mission in here, that I'm going to live full on purpose and die empty. And you see, veterinarians, vet veterinarians, when they talk about sheep, they say sheep have a lifespan of some 20 or 25 years. Mm -hmm. The sheep of the Bible were not raised for their meat or their, their muton. And muton is when they cut or kill a sheep at different ages. They get lamb and different Pacific cuts. But that's not what the sheep in the Bible was raised for. They were really raised for their wool. Mm -hmm. And so the sheep were somewhat treated like pets and became part of the family. The point is, sheep had identities and were known to the shepherd. Uh, the shepherd knows and even called their sheep names, and the sheep knows the shepherd's voice. Do I have a witness? And not only do the sheep know their voice, but the sheep even knows the weight of the shepherd's rod uh, that guides them uh, and, and, and leads them. Mm -hmm. One of the Old Testament scholars by the name of Delish said that King David was an old man when he wrote this psalm uh, in disagreement with many theologians who thought he was a young man, a young man who was laying out on the grass as he was shepherding the sheep, looking up, just thinking about all that God would do. But that really is not the case. Research would show you that David was an older man uh, and he was no longer wanting anything more because uh, the Lord had already provided but David is looking retrospectively back and saying, just basically, God is so good. Uh, and David is not lying in green patches, uh, looking up in the sky, pondering his relationship with God in the here and now. But he's older and reflective and introspective of the journey of life, especially 
right now while his own son Absalom uh, has rebelled and has taken the kingdom. And so this, 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 this Psalm 23 is really for mature believers or believers who want to mature. Believers who are ready to grow up and move into their next season of life spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Uh, this is for believers who've been through some battles. Anybody got some battle scars? You, you've been through some ups and downs. You carried some burdens, shed some tears. Uh, this psalm is written from a, 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 not from a shepherd's perspective. This psalm is not written from a shepherd's perspective, but is written from a sheep perspective. And it sets the table for four things on the menu. Can I give it to you real quick? These are not my four points, but it's something I think you need to know. Uh, four things on the menu that the sheep gets from the shepherd. One, adequacy. Mm -hmm. This is verse one through three. He meets all my needs. Mm. Serenity, which is verse four. Certainty, which is verse five. And eternity, which is verse six. Four things on the menu. He sets that table and visualize that table not only being in the presence of his enemy, I can prepare a table anywhere. But there's always ad adequacy and there's always serenity, certainty, and eternity. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to break him verse by verse. We only got six of them. And I'm going to go pretty quick. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, my God. I shall not be in want. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. Don't, don't miss it. The Lord is my shepherd, but not a rancher. There's a distinction between a shepherd and a rancher. Uh, many of us pastors claim to be shepherds, but we're really ranchers. Because ranchers stay at distance from their sheep. They like to manage and delegate, but they don't smell like their sheep. Uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about a, a, a shepherd, a shepherd who is integrated and involved and engaged, who's not trying to run around and preach for everybody else uh, and go in town and out of town, but are present with their sheep, knows their, uh, their circumstances and situations, knows their names, feels their pain, can identify with them. Uh, this is what David is talking about, a shepherd that, that, that herds, guides, and guards and tend and, and, and also attend to his sheep. Uh, he's a hands-on or she is a hands-on kind of shepherd. Anybody hear me? Uh, and, but not a rancher, the model of leadership that delegates and mobilizes and catalyzes, but don't know their sheep. Ranchers don't know their sheep. Shepherds just smell like their sheep. Ranchers pass through. Are you hearing me? Too busy to spend time with the sheep. David, knowing that shepherds are the lowliest on the low totem pole, the lowliest of, in Hebrew society. Yet, you see here, he's confessing a deep humility and trust of Yahweh God. Because Yahweh God the Father is a shepherd. And so David, who is a shepherd that became king, is aware that even in the language of that time, Kings will even use the term of shepherding their, their nation, shepherding and guiding Israel and Judea, shepherding. So that language is still used in, a, in king. And David, the shepherd boy, became king. Uh, and from that confession comes his and our comfort that God, the Lord, Abba, uh, Yahweh is a shepherd. I, I don't know about you, but that gives me comfort. Uh, whatever else we say about this beloved psalm, we must be sure to point to the centrality of the article of faith that is here, uh, which is that uh, Yahweh God, my shepherd, uh, it never will leave me or forsake him, take me, and he does all things well. Anybody know that God does all things well? Uh, I, I, my, I, my father in heaven sets the table of life for me, and that is what Psalm 23 speaks of. He is my source and my resource. Lord, have mercy. For not just one area of my life, not just for my church life, my religious life, but he sets the table for every area of my life. And, and really, it's not about making me happy. It's making me more content, and you content in him because you know that he's more than enough. Anybody know that God is more than enough for you? He's more than enough. He's more than enough. And so I, I submit and you should submit to the shepherd because uh, he's in complete control. And listen, he's on my side. Oh, that, that, that right there, he's on my side. He holds my future in his hands and I can trust his hands. You know you can't trust everybody. Oh, Lord Jesus, you can't trust everybody's hands. Amen. I can trust his hands. 
Uh, he, he gives me favor even in the furlough uh, where, where I can see the, listen, I can see the fur of comfort and make sure I don't go so low that I can't even get up. Uh, God is about like, comforting his children, making things better. There's no promise that you're not going to go through some hell because there is a valley and a shadow of death in the text too. All right? You're going to go through, but he said, I'm going to go with you. And I'll never leave you or forsake her. Mm -hmm. Help me preach this a little while. So the comfort of Psalm 3, 23 is deepened mm, and strengthened when we recall that Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd, which he is in John 10. The Lord is my shepherd. And so when you really read the Hebrew and you get up under the word, is is not in Hebrew there. Uh, it, it's the Lord, my shepherd. It's basically a mathematical equation. The Lord equals shepherd. Mm -hmm. uh, he's saying this is not no passing role, but a permanent identity. Mm -hmm. This is simply who he is. I, I just, he says, I just like to take care of my peeps. I, I, I got you. I, I like to be engaged in you. He, that's simply who he is. And, and, and in the English word, uh, the word that the Lord is, just is, is a per perfect progressive tense. Mm -hmm. It means it is and always will be, and nothing's going to change his mind. Uh, progressively, no matter how far you go out, he always going to be my shepherd. He, it, uh, I don't far, how far you progress down the line, uh, I, I'm going to be right there. This is simply who I am. I have guaranteed direction mm -hmm, from God. Uh, you, you, you can drop uh, down and keep going, and, say, and I shall not once. I call that in contract, we call that the clause that makes sure everything's straight. Mm -hmm. uh, that he dropped the I shall not want clause because everything you need is supplied and not everything you want, everything you need. Could you imagine if God gave us everything we want? <sighs> Somebody that say, ouch. We would hurt ourselves, kill ourselves, mess up. You would have some crazy people in your life if God would have gave you what you wanted. You better thank him right there. God, I'm glad I didn't get what I wanted. I might have got something else along the way. I'm glad you said no sometimes, uh, but you gave me what I need, but you didn't always give me what I wanted. Because if I got some of the people I wanted, I would be all jacked up right now. Thank you, Jesus, for not giving me what I wanted. I touched it. I teased it. I messed with it. But you said no. You blocked it. Jesus, you blocked it and you blessed me. I couldn't see all that was tangled up in there, but you knew uh, what I really needed and you stepped me back even though you moonwalked me back out of that situation. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And some of us went past God and thought we needed it. Now we want out. Preach, Pastor Maxwell. John 10, 11 through 18. Jesus boldly says, I am the good shepherd. And those words he was echoing from Psalm 23 to catch you that picture of the shepherd. And then it goes verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside still waters. There's some interesting facts regarding shepherds that you have to know. Uh, shepherds at night, or what we should say, will usually herd their sheep back into their pen. Put them all, gather them, put them back in their pen. And he, a good shepherd lays at the door, which Jesus talked about in the Gospel of John, that he, he's a gate. So he's going to lay at the, the door and act as security. So if you want to come to get the sheep like a wolf, you got to go through Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right, right. And, and sometimes they will let even sheep wander at a certain difference, distance, especially throughout the fields at night. The sheep, because of the wool, is so heavy as the sheep are going up the hill, the heaviness on top of the wool turns them over. They literally fall over. Mm -hmm. So if they walk on the side of the hill, it's feasible for the sheep to fall and, listen, not be able to get up. The weight of the wool will pin them to the ground. Their feet are up, and they cannot stand. Are you seeing a picture? And so the shepherd in the morning will go out, find the sheep lying on their backs and all through the pasture because they, can, they can't get up on their own. Then the shepherd will pick the sheep up, literally, set them on their feet, reorient them, and let them go so they can find their way. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. 
Uh, we are just like that. We are sheep. Have you ever been knocked down and couldn't get up? Have you ever been slapped on your back and couldn't handle it? Uh, and, and God came by. Sometimes he will have to break a lave of one who wanders so much, put them on your shoulders and carry you back to your pen and let you heal. Uh, but, but the shepherd, I'm glad he comes and get me. I'm glad that the shepherd came and got me. Uh, and, and while I was laying on my back doing some wrong things, he, he allowed me to have another chance. And he picked me up and turned me around and plant my feet on solid ground. We are sheep, aren't we? The Lord is a shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and he leadeth me beside still waters. You see, the, the shepherd knows the sheep can't lay down just anywhere. Come on, just look at your neighbor and say, sheep can't lay down just anywhere. You see, sheep are, 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 they, they, they are sensitive. So, so when they lay down, if there's any friction or, or, or if there's some nature of fear or fright or there's too many fleas. Uh, or, or if there is a, come on now, help me preach it, a, 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 a funk that they can't like, they don't like the smell, the funk, the funk, the funk, they can't handle. See, they, they really, when they are shepherding, they move behind each other and really, uh, this is a kind of name, a, a little nasty looking thing, but they, they, they stick so close behind each other, they know the smell of each other's behind. And when there's a smell that is different from that, they consider it funk. Mm hmm so they can't be around friction. They, can't, they, they don't want to be around for fearful situations and frightful or fleas. Uh, but they also don't want to be around famine. They don't want to be hungry. They want to put their nozzles in the grass and they want to be able to graze and get some food on a continuous basis. Oh, Lord. So he says, when he says, uh, he make me to lie down, he makes me. Uh, sometimes God has to make you. Push you. Now, let me say it another one. Too many of us refuse to get rest and God has to make you lay down. God's trying to slow you down and make you lay down and quiet your soul. You can't sleep because God's trying to make you lay down. He has to make some of uh, us lay down because we don't know how to go to bed at night. We on social media all night and talking to people all night and we can't operate at work. So he has to make his sheep lay down. Somebody said, make me lay down, baby. He makes me to lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. See, the shepherd is after creating quietness mm -hmm, to make us to be quiet, thereby our spirits and souls and inner cells can be restored. Mm -hmm. Stop asking people to restore your soul. Let God restore you. And the best way to do it is get away from people and get quiet with God and let him minister to you and restore your soul. The spiritual discipline of silence and solitude is so critical for the next phase of this world. We're going to have to spend more time with God and listen and not only tune to know his voice, but keep clarity in our minds because the news and the small messages and the social media creates a fog in our minds. And, and I'm converting the fog of the enemy to the F-O-G, the favor of God. Because I'm going to spend time with God so I can have clarity of mind and spirit. So I can do what God wants me to do. Not only in 2019, but for the rest of my life. Make me lie down in green pastures. Oh God, come on, help me. Let me lie down in green pastures. Mm, God, 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 God wants us to learn how to lay down. And I'm so glad he didn't say some wilderness. He said, I want to put you in green pastures. Oh, whoo, Jesus, oh, that's fruitful pastures. That's, uh, that's delicious pastures. That's, that's pastures that has my investment. He's investing in me. God is investing in me. He's not just putting me anywhere. And he sure not don't want no friction, no fleas, and no fright, no funk, or no famine. Preach, Pastor Max, what I'm trying, I'm trying. So God puts you down and he lays you. Why, why? Another reason why? Because destiny decisions and experiential dreams are happen when you lay down in the presence of God. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but the enemy is fighting you in your dreams. 
And he wants time with you so you can really get clarity of destiny decisions and experience dreams while you're laying down quietly in his presence. God wants to invest in you so your dreams uh, could get larger and you can begin to see him. Uh, but you got to understand when you come up out of there, stop telling big dreams to small-minded people. Stop telling your big dreams to small-minded people. Stop, stop telling them because they try to penetrate your personality and puncture your promise and co-opt your character. Make sure you tell the right person about your dreams because a lot of small-minded people can't handle the big dreams that God. And the more you spend time with God, the bigger he make your dreams and visions. The more you sup with him and commune with him. But don't come out of there and try to share it with a small-minded, listen, lover who don't... Who, oh God who's not really interested in your dreams. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody, but y'all didn't hear it. Oh, he leads me, lay, helps me to lay down. He leads me beside still, still waters, still waters, oh, still waters. And in the Hebrew, that one phrase, still water, it means he leads me beside the waters of rest. I like that. Because our souls need rest. Sheep need constant washing. As they stick their every hungry snouts in the grass below into the hinder parts of the sheep in front of them and wander without a thought up and down the land, eating and defecating and straying up on dangerous hillsides and down rushing waters, foolishly risking fleece and mouton again and again to utter frustration and consternation of the shepherd. Sheep are not too bright. They make stupid decisions. And I know I'm not the only one that has made some real dumb decisions in my life. The dumbest decision I ever made was trying to do things without God. Woo! Get in relationships without God. Go ahead without consulting God. It's the dumbest decision. Uh, and we, can, we, we will go and stray in dangerous hillsides and down rushing waters. And so you flee, a sheep can't really swim well. So they need the water to be still to get through it. Lord Jesus, oh, I'll leave it alone because I got to hurry up. Verse 3, verse 3, he restored my soul and leading me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All God has done and is doing is to ensure that my soul and your soul is renewed, revived, and restored in preparation. Mm -hmm. So I want you to understand the revelation of the text. He wants you to rest because he's preparing you for new valleys, new dark places, New death predicaments, new challenges, new enemies, new haters. And so what the, the revelation is, I have to build your bank up of rest, clarity, strength, vision, and dreams. So you uh, can be able to deal with what's coming. Oh, oh God. Whew. I got to build your bank up where there is a repetition of withdrawals from your bank that's about to happen. And you won't be able to endure them spiritually, mentally, or emotionally, and physically. You will go bankrupt if you don't learn how to let God restore you and get you able to handle it. Some of you are past your capacity to deal with the hell you're going through right now. And so you're so close to the edge, you're about to run out of your skin. But God is saying, listen, if you give me some time with you and let me have you for a while I not only prepare you for the enemies that's coming but I'm going to bless you as I prepare you Jesus I, he says uh, I have been setting up these opportunities for rest but you refuse to take it uh, I, I've been setting up these opportunities for 21 days of prayer to spend time with me but you refuse to take the time and spend it with me you'll spend it with everybody else but you won't spend it with me I'm trying to prepare you for what's coming. If you read your scripture, uh, worse is coming. Uh, in this day, there'll be a form of godliness and they'll deny the power thereof. Uh, there's going to be all kind of craziness coming. And if you don't learn the discipline to spend time with God, you will be bankrupt. The Bible said many will say, Lord, Lord, will never enter to the kingdom of God because they're going to be bankrupt. The Bible says hearts and minds will fail when they're under crisis because they are not prepared. They're bankrupt. They're not built up on the inside with God. I'm trying to help some Somebody to, uh, he, he restored my soul and he leads me in the path of righteousness. He said, I'm setting up opportunities for you to rest so you can better take advantage of them. 
Because I'm in yesterday, today, and tomorrow all at the same time. And I want you to know what's down the line. I've already saw what's down the line. And there's some real challenges. And I need you to spend some more time with me. You can't eat everywhere. You must graze where the glory is. And too many of us are eating at the wrong table with the wrong people. And this, this is Texas trying to tell us uh, we got to graze where the glory is, not where the gain. And if you seek gain versus glory, you will always wander, wonder, and worry versus worship. Can I say that a little bit slower? You can't eat everywhere. You must graze where the glory is. You don't graze where the gain is. That's a lot. That's what we're taught in a capitalistic society. Keep keep pursuing gain and getting and having material and things and money and keep going. Uh, but if you seek gain versus his glory, you will always wonder, mm -hmm, wonder, and you're sure enough will worry versus having outright worship. Hmm. Okay, let me let me keep moving on because the journey consists of past. Look at your Bible. Pass is plural. The journey consists of pass. He, 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 what? Pass of righteousness. The, the, the Greek word is megalim. Uh, really, in the Hebrew, it's a little bit different, but Hebrew is megalim. Greek is maglev. But the word pass uh, of righteousness, maglim, is interesting. When you really look at the Hebrew Bible, it translates as tracks, like we have kingdom tracks, train tracks, entrenchments, or even ruts. This is the picture of uh, an ox cart that's being pulled in soil that is not firm, and it creates tracks in it. Everybody see the picture? Uh, sometimes we got the, the, the van gets stuck over there in the mud, and it leaves tracks. Mm -hmm. And your car does too, I know. We, we're trying to work on that. Amen. And so, so the, the word magalim is, in fact, related to the word of a, a young cow uh, being in the cart adding more weight, pressing it down. So when he says the path of righteousness, more like the ruts is grooves in the wheel of your ox cart. Mm -mm. Stay with me now. So walking with Yahweh, walking with God, our Father, the shepherd, uh, it helps me to find my groove. Y'all going to get it in a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, the righteousness, uh, a righteous groove is a narrow, the, the pathway uh, is narrow, narrow is the way, but broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow, so I, I need some groove, so he says, I'm creating paths of righteousness that constantly lead to me, paths of right. and I'm not talking of religion, I'm not talking Muhammad, uh, I'm not talking about in the Hindu, I'm not, not, that's not paths of righteousness, I'm talking about there's one path in Jesus, uh, but, but there's ways that Jesus will drive you, and you got to keep your cart on the track. Because if you get off the track, you're going to miss the righteousness. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, uh, so, so he's trying to help us. He lived this way uh, to live on the right relationship with God, and the right uh, path promotes and sustains the relationship you have with God. You have to stay on track. Somebody say, stay on track. Because he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not for my name's sake. Because he purchased me with the blood of Jesus. I no longer belong to my side, myself, uh, but it's really for his glory. And so the way David ends this text gives us reason to trust our shepherd. Uh, even when we can't understand his leading, he guides us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He puts his glory at the stake of the way you are, are, are flowing in your life. Uh, he puts his name, uh, oh, y'all missing it. He's putting his name on you so he has an expectation that you stay on track. Uh, uh, he loves us so much, he puts his name at risk. Oh, God, God. He does all this stuff for his own name's sake. Oh, God, and his glory and honor and reputation. That shouldn't surprise us after all the entire universe exists simply to glorify God. Oh, I got to close this. I'll have to give you a part two another day because we got a meeting that we got to go in. But I'll just say this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It is true that a shepherd does not remove perils from the flock, but enables it to pass through them safely. First, there's a dark valley where death does not seem far off. God is still there, the psalmist affirms. But in the dark, one could say that the eye no longer sees anything. There's only hearing. Note that sheep are just about blind already. They have some of the worst vision of all the animals in the world. So darkness is not always outside. Darkness could be your capacity to see. 
So the revelation is, is that even as I'm growing and I don't have the clear vision that my God will see me through the valley of the shadow of death and I don't have to fear. As I'm not afraid to keep his rod on me, right? For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Notice it does not say spank me. Mm -hmm. His rod intention never was to spank, but he will not spare the rod. But, but he has to have the rod to bring correction so you can stay on track. Come on, somebody. And because your vision is not clear, you don't have enough of Jesus yet to see clear enough. And so he's got to guide you till you mature in the spirit. And so by tapping the staff on the ground, he makes, he makes a little note like that. He taps it and sends signals to the sheep so the sheep can understand which way to move. And so this is an honest text. I, I like this text because it's, it's not a social media text. You know, you know, social media text, social media presents the best and then hides the rest. See, 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 God's not like that, right? Social media presents the best and hides the rest. Yeah, see, 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 this text is honest. It's saying, I never promise you that you're not going to go through some difficult days. I never promise you that you won't have no valleys. I never promise you that the shadow of death would not come to your house. I never promise you that evil will never be there. I never promise you that you, you, will, you won't need me. I promised you that I'll go through the death with you. I, I, I help you to fear no evil when the evil comes upon you. And I will comfort you with my rod and I won't kill you. Sometimes we deserve death, but he doesn't kill us. But he said, I prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. I really wanted to get down and bring out a table and put down some nice uh, uh, tablecloths and put some chairs down and put some flowers on it today. I really wanted to model this text. Maybe I'll preach part two and three to it because I wanted you to see that he prepares a table in the presence of your enemies, which means he says he prepares a table before you. So he takes you. He said, let's go down the block where your enemies at. Uh, uh, and then he and said, I see your enemies. He puts a table there and a bad chair, not just any kind of chair. He puts the best of flowers on the table. He puts the best of crystal on the table. He puts fine china on the table. And then he just blesses you. What he does is he anoints you with oil. Listen, your enemies are watching this the whole time. Your enemies are watching him anoint your head with oil, which means that I am confirming I am with you and I'm giving you part of myself. And so you don't have to worry about those Negroes that are looking at you funny. Uh, and not only that, I'm going to fill your cup. He pops the wine out. And he pours the wine. He pours that drink and he fills up. And so the picture is the enemies are way off. On the margins, watching you being blessed. You, he, the, uh, God is saying, I'm pouring the wine. I got food on the table. I got blessings on the table. And your enemy is in the margins watching. What it is, is you are being used as an invitation to save your enemy. And if you allow God to use you and allow him to bless you, and allow him, listen, put you on display so you can see his glory inside of you. He will bless you in the presence of your enemies. So don't be afraid of devils. Don't be afraid of haters. Don't be afraid of those who want to attack you. They're just doing their job. But God says, I got you. I got a table with your name on it. I got reservations that's in advance for you. I got something I'm going to bless you even in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to raise you up so you don't have to ever feel down. I'm going to bless you coming and bless you going. I'm going to bless you with some fine wine and fine china. I'm going to take you on the best date in your life. This is not just a Valentine's. It's every day when you're in God. I got some flowers. I got some candy. I got some perfume. I'm going to let the enemy see who you are and what you mean to me. Is anybody glad about it? Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you, Lord, for being my shepherd that I shall not want. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me in the field and blessing me in the city. God, we pray that we study your word and learn more of your character, God. We pray that we study your word and learn more about who you really are. Let us not put the song just to memory, but let us go deep down and really understand the revelation because you are making promises that you always keep. And you love us so much, you're willing to put our name on it. You're willing to go and prepare a table with me at the table and you prepare where I can see it.
it and my enemies can see it. So God, I just want to thank you in advance for blessing me in advance. And so in 2019, I can't wait to sit at your table. I promise, though, that I'm going to have manners. I'm not going to look down on my enemy. I'm not going to cuss my enemy out. I'm going to have table manners. I'm going to act dignified in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to make sure that my manners and my matters really matter to you, God. I'm going to get my act together so I can dine with you, God, and make sure that the day in the end, when the new day comes, when there's a grand reunion in heaven, I'll be at a banquet table with Jesus. Paul will be there. Peter will be there. But I really want to see Jesus face to face at the banquet table. Thank you, God, for choosing me and using me. Come on, say thank God. Put your hand on yourself. Say thank God for loving me, for keeping me, for watching over me, for being so good to me. Thank you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and give you glory. Ooh, I like to keep going, but I got to stop. Father, thank you. Bless right now, God. Bless your sheep. God, I know I'm just the under-shepherd, but they, the sheep belong to you, God. Help us pastors not to, oh God, just feed the sheep, not marry the sheep, not lay down with the sheep. Feed the sheep. Help us pastors around the earth, God, to know that this is your bride, the church. It's not our bride. That we had to make sure that we got our marriage certificate right. It's your bride, Jesus. Your sheep. Help me, God, to be a better shepherd day by day. I know I got much to learn, but I submit to you, God, that you're more than able to help me get to where I need to be. Bless these sheep called each friendship. Bless them in the fields and in the city, God. Bless them in a way that they can see you in a new way. Help them to spend deep time with you, God. They may fulfill this Psalm 23. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody, give my hand clap of praise. Right now.